Good morning and welcome. I'm Vi and the Martin family. Thank you for gathering with them to celebrate, commemorate Dave's life. Um, this morning we want to give God the glory for the grace of giving Dave to us, the grace he ministered through him. We want to grieve our loss, our profound and real loss. Um, he, is, he is the richer, we are the poorer. Make no mistake. This morning we will be singing some of Dave's favorite hymns. We're hearing words from uh, his family. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we, we ask for grace uh, that you would sustain us, that you would help us to speak and act in a way that brings you glory and honor. Our desire is to give you thanks and to grieve and comfort each other. We want to celebrate your grace manifest in Dave Martin's life. So, Lord God, we just pray that you would uh, be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. David Jean Martin passed away Tuesday, February 6th, 2018, at the age of 76. He is survived by his wife, Viola, children Rick Martin, Russell Martin, Randall Martin, Rhonda, and Bradley Houts. Grandchildren, Destiny, Colton, Eric, and Jasmine Martin, Ethan, Ella, and Elena Houts. Great-grandchildren, Aurelia, Bailey Martin, Damon Bailey, Keaton Reed, his brother Richard Martin, and many, many nieces and nephews. He was preceded in death by his parents, Gordon and Francis Martin, and brother Philip Martin. David was born on May 14, 1941, in St. Charles, Iowa, the son of Gordon and Francis Martin. He grew up on a farm outside of St. Charles. Dave graduated from St. Charles High School in 1959. After some college, he became an appliance and refrigerator repairman for O'Callaghan's for many years, and he retired from Westside Parts and Service about 10 years ago. In June of 1963, he married his one and only love, Viola. God blessed them with four children. He enjoyed and loved his family and would attend events of his children and grandchildren as he loved seeing them involved in their different activities. Dave followed Christ and demonstrated his faith in many different ways. His daily walk with God, his generous heart, and his involvement in church. He was a longtime member and elder of Martinsdale Community Church. In younger years, he was often found in the sound room, running the audio and making copies of cassette tapes in the services. If the church was having a service or activity, Dave was there with his family in tow. Dave was a ham radio operator. He enjoyed spending many hours building and contacting other ham operators across the country. David loved to go camping. He would often enjoy camping trips with his family and friends. David loved his family, and they will miss him terribly, but they know they will see him again in heaven. I want to share a few thoughts uh, from the family. First, from Dave's, son's, Dave's son, Randy. What I remember of my dad, lots of things, too many to mention. I always loved how he prayed at the dinner table when everyone was there, including the grandkids, he would always start out thanking God for sending his son Jesus to die for us and take the penalty of our sin away. His faith always encouraged me. I always enjoyed listening to him pray and talk to God. Another time, just last month, he took me aside and with lots of love in his eyes, he told me how much he loved my mom and how appreciative he was of her for all the times she'd help him with his oxygen and his back problems. He was very appreciative of all the things she did for him. He thanked God for her being there. I let him know that I loved her too, and am very thankful that she was there to help him. 
I'm so thankful for my mom and dad's love for each other. It is such an example that for the world today. I hope one day I can live up to his example, to be a man like he was. I'm going to miss him, and I know I will see him again someday when God calls me home. Then from Dave's daughter, Rhonda, my dad. I am the daughter and the youngest member of the family, so I may have had a special place in dad's heart. (laughs) At least I like to think so. Actually, it was dad who had a special place in my heart. Some things I remember about my dad are his faith, love for family, and his willingness to help. Before the grandchildren opened presents on Christmas, Dad would gather them around and read the Christmas story. He would tell us the importance of having Jesus in our lives, and then he would sit back and enjoy the chaos of the grandkids opening gifts. One time when I was sick, Mom and Dad came to live with us for a month, taking care of the house and the kids. This task was not an easy one since we were in the middle of moving and had three young kids to cart around. Brad and I were and always will be forever grateful. My dad was also the first person I called when someone, something would go wrong around our house. He spent time assisting in various projects whenever he would visit our home. When we came home for a visit, dad would always end it by saying, you're always welcome here. Come whenever you can, and he meant it. I will miss you, Dad. I wish I didn't have to say goodbye so soon. You are my daddy, and I love you. I'll see you in heaven. I personally knew Dave for just under five years, which compared to a lot of you is not long at all. But (laughs) during those five years, we had roughly 120 elder meetings. (laughs) which Dave and I were at together. Dave was always, almost always there. He was consistent, faithful, cheerful, and humble. Dave viewed these meetings as a privilege, and he took them very seriously. In my life, probably for my age, I've been to too many board meetings. Uh, And before coming to MCC, it was my experience that A lot of time was wasted dealing with people who thought they knew more than they really did. So when I got here, Dave was a breath of fresh air. Dave knew what he understood, and he knew what he didn't understand, and he never wasted time pretending that he knew something he didn't. That simple humility was such a joy to be around. In our meetings, he would often have to be asked to share his thoughts, And more often than not, he'd respond by telling a story or referring to a sermon that he heard decades ago. But even though he was often silent, he spoke up when he thought that we were missing something. Now keep in mind, or now you've got to remember, or one that I heard on more than one occasion, you might not know this, but Dave loved MCC. He loved its history. Sometimes in our meetings, he would share things that even Greg Sweet didn't know. (laughs) But more than history or buildings, Dave loved the people of the church. He knew so many of the small hurts and sufferings of the people. When on occasion people would choose their sin rather than Christ, I think Dave genuinely did not comprehend that. He could not understand why. It baffled and saddened him whenever someone would choose their sin instead of Jesus Christ. He wasn't afraid to make hard decisions or unpopular decisions, but they had to be biblical decisions. If that's what God's Word says, that's what we believe, and that's what we need to do. As was already mentioned, Dave loved his family and loved to be with them, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. One of the things that he enjoyed recently was listening to his granddaughter, Ella, play the piano, and Ella will share one of those songs with us now.
Rick and the family asked me if I could share a few memories of Dave this morning, and I'll do my best to get through that. I was happy to do it and honored. Um, it's going to be tough. He did say I could have up to 20 to 30 minutes, <laughs> that I could go in front of Joel, and uh, so I, <clears throat> I readily agreed. Uh, it's very hard to reduce years of memories into just a few minutes. I wish I was good at remembering the uh, funny stories or events that Dave told, because he had many, um, and things that, uh, that he could recall. But generally, I'm not good at that, remembering the specifics. <clears throat> As an appliance repairman, Dave always had interesting and sometimes funny stories, uh, mostly of the homes he had been in over the years. And again, I wish I could recall exact stories, but I can remember many times he would keep me laughing uh, as he would recount some of his strange encounters. Uh, of course, I would also call him from time to time when I needed some free advice on how to repair an appliance. Uh, you know, he never offered to come down and help me with it, though. I don't know what the deal was, but no, it was, it was good. Uh, Dave also loved music, uh, loved camping. So if you combine the two, what you would get is camping in Branson and then gospel music or quartets or shows at night. Um, if you were ever to visit Dave and Vi in Branson while they were camping, which we did, uh, he would suggest the best place to go to church on Sunday. He would also suggest the best place for breakfast uh, in the morning. Um, we did take them up on that. Of course, he said they had the largest pancakes as well, so we had to try that. Um, if Dave had been born 40 or 50 years later than he was, he could have been a techie or a computer nerd. But instead, he was an electronics and radio guy. Dave served, uh, as has already been mentioned for many years, as the sound guy. He was just the sound guy at church. I honestly don't remember the first time I met Dave, um, but it would have been about 35 or 36 years ago, most likely as the husband of Teacher Vi. Um, many of you, uh, like, like me, all of my children were taught by Teacher Vi in Sunday school class. So I'm, I'm sure that's when I, I actually first met him. Dave loved the Lord, his family, and this church, meaning the people of this body. Dave served for many years on the elder board. I have had the pleasure of serving with Dave over about the last 12 years. Dave was our resident historian. As hard as it is to believe, Dave could actually remember pastors before Pastor Joel. Dave had a way of telling stories and recounting an event to illustrate a point. But at the same time, he could also be very direct when he needed to be. Dave hated to miss meetings, uh, especially elder meetings. In the last months and weeks of his life, life, when he clearly did not feel good, he would send me a text and apologize that he just didn't feel good enough to make it to the meeting. He took his role very serious seriously, and um, he'll be missed. Dave will be missed by his family, friends, this church, and those of us on the board. His gentle spirit, his love for the Lord, was a testimony to us all. Dave is with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no more struggling and no more pain with his failing body. I know his desire would be that if you do not know Christ here today, that you would come to a saving knowledge of him, that the good news of the gospel would penetrate deep into each of our lives. I would like to read just a few verses from 1 Corinthians 15, uh, starting in verse 12, 12 through 14. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Uh, so your faith also is in vain. And then skipping down to verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then, we, uh, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Before reading the scripture from which Pastor Jeremy will speak, I just want to add a couple personal notes of how much I valued David over the years. He and Vi were in the church when we came 50 years ago this May, and uh, over those years we had a great relationship. I too could see how he served the Lord so faithfully over those years, more than 30 years on the elder board, faithfully serving and setting up the PA system and keeping it running well, helping in so many other practical ways. He was always kind, always helpful, always giving. We shared a lot in common. He and I were just almost exactly the same age. He would remind me often I was three months older than he. But uh, we shared just about the same age. Uh, we lived in the same town. We had kids that were about the same age who went to the same school together. And uh, both of us had great wives. So we had a lot in common. I thank the Lord for putting him into my life and for the joyful reunion that we're going to share one day in the future through the Lord Jesus. I want to read two brief passages, one from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, I said chapter to chapter 6. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then from 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul writes, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's bow together in a moment of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you with all my heart for the life of David Martin. I thank you for many years ago opening his eyes to his need of a Savior and bringing him to put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the way that you blessed him the way you worked through him in so many different ways. 
over the years that you gave him here. I just worship you for your goodness through him to all of us. I just would pray so much, Lord, for your strength and encouragement for Viola and all the family in the days ahead that they might just sense your presence, your love for them, and they'll keep very conscious of the wonder of that which is before us and which David right now is experiencing. We thank you for the tremendous difference that you have made in our lives at a time like this. I pray your blessing upon the sharing of your word today through Pastor Jeremy, and you just guide him and help us to hear and to apply. In Jesus' name, amen. I've had the privilege of of knowing Dave for a decade, uh, since when I first came to this church. And uh, the passage I want to look at this morning was a passage in my mind as I'd go visit Dave in the hospital. Um, And it's the passage the Apostle Paul wrote just prior to his death, knowing that his death was coming soon. Paul was an old man, and he was in prison he writes to his young disciple, son in the faith, Timothy, these sobering words. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The Apostle Paul pictures himself like a glass or a vase of water that's being poured and emptied out. And I remember thinking, as I'd visit Dave in the hospital, there's a few more drops, a few more drops until it's empty. His course has a few more steps, but sensing as well that his time to depart was drawing near. And in this passage, as Paul speaks about his own life and the end of his life, he references prior instructions to Timothy, the common phrase being the good fight. Only occurs one other place, and it's in Paul's charge to Timothy. So as we try to look to understand just exactly what is it Paul means when he says he's fought the good fight, he's finished his race, he's kept the faith, I think we need to turn back to 1 Timothy 6 where Paul elaborates giving that command to Timothy. And there we read, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I take it that when the Apostle Paul says he has fought the good fight, I have finished my race, that he is claiming that through God's grace, he has accomplished the charge he gave to Timothy. And as I think of Dave and his life, I think in many ways he models that same faithfulness. Dave fought the good fight. Dave has now finished his race. Dave kept the faith. And I just want to make two observations here. What does it mean to fight the fight of faith? It's the first one. Well, it, Paul is describing the Christian life in battle terms. And there is a sense in which the Christian life, there's peace, and there's rest come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And there's a sense in which it is a real battle in war. Not a battle in war with enemies outside, but a battle in war with yourself, with your own heart your own sinful desires. And the Christian life, we see, is entered into by faith. 
Paul references this of Timothy. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, probably referring to Timothy's baptism. And so Paul is hearkening Timothy back to that inceptive beginning moment of his Christian walk where he made a confession. And and the word confess means to testify or to admit or to to speak. It doesn't always mean of wrongdoing. In fact, the Greek word marturo, we get the word martyr from. And the earliest Christians spoke of those who had faithfully confessed as confessors from which we get the term martyr. So what exactly did Timothy confess? What does it mean to enter Christianity by faith? I think it means to confess, first of all, we need saving, to confess that you're a sinner. Not just that you're a good person who makes mistakes, but that at the innermost core of my being and your being, there is something broken, rotten, dead, something that wants to do what it wants to do, and it doesn't want to be told what to do. And if we're all honest, we, we, we've lived that way following desires of the body and the mind. And that's a sort of slavery. And we confess that we are the, the, the poor, the blind, the enslaved. It also means to confess Christ as Lord. According to Romans, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you'll have life. What, what you're saying there is, I have been building my life on all these lesser things, all these, these soap bubbles, this trash. I've been serving other gods, the God of pleasure, money, fame, achievement. And I now confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the one to whom I will turn and entrust myself and my life to. His righteous life for my life, his death in place of my death. And his resurrection is the prototype of my resurrection. Dave confessed the good confession. I don't know when, many years back, but I did know day to day he continued to confess that. Because that's, that's the next point. What we see here is that not only is the Christian life entered into by faith, we, we, we get united to Christ by faith, by confessing our unworthiness, by confessing his righteousness, by trusting in his death on the cross and his resurrection. We, we enter into a relationship with God. We receive the forgiveness of sins. We are born again. But not only does the Christian life begin by faith in this confession, Paul's emphasis to young Timothy, who's already a Christian, is that the Christian life must continue by faith. The three charges, fight the good fight, take hold of eternal life, keep the commandment. And all of this is done equally by faith. The faith that saves is a faith that will persevere and move. And so Paul is urging Timothy by reminding him back to the confession he made, maybe you decades ago, gave yourself to the Lord, turned to Christ in faith. Paul's word for you, Dave's word for you, would be to remember that and fight the fight of faith, the fight of pursuing righteousness, the fight of pursuing godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And if you knew Dave Martin, you knew that that was a fight he claimed very much victory in. He was a gentle Godly, loving, steadfast, faithful man. But it's a battle to do that. Even now, my own heart doesn't naturally incline to that. So Paul charges Timothy to take hold of eternal life. And, And the concept here is this. In our profession of faith, we make a claim to eternal life, but that claim to eternal life is evidenced And we begin to actually live in its principle as we act in faith and grow. So Paul is saying, Timothy, years ago in the presence of many witnesses, you testified. You made a good confession. You you professed faith in Jesus. Now live it out. Take hold of eternal life. Live in that principle. And then he gives this solemn charge. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made a good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a solemn charge. 
That's why Paul brings in the big guns to bear. God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ keep the commandment. So Paul is urging Timothy, what does it mean to fight the fight of faith? It means to do this very thing. It means to do this very thing. Faith is how you enter into the Christian life. Faith is how you continue in the Christian life. And faith is how you finish the Christian life. And now we're back to 2 Timothy and Paul. He's an old man. He's locked up in jail and he's still being faithful. Elsewhere in the letter, he wants Timothy to bring him some books because he's still got some research and work he wants to do. And I just think of Dave, him and his poor health, showing up to our meetings with an oxygen tank. The man loved Jesus Christ, and I know he did because I saw how much he loved Christ's bride. And Dave, in his last months, was pouring himself out for his family, but he was pouring himself out for this church. He took so seriously the job of being a shepherd and overseer. He cared so deeply. I think of Paul's words. Is anyone led into sin or temptation? I'm not troubled. Dave, Dave would be grieved, as Pastor Daniel said. He wouldn't understand. It would just, he'd hurt when people made poor, sinful decisions. And he, he would show up here, and he was faithful. He, he was poured out towards the end, and yet he finished his course. He did not balk at the end. The Christian life is entered into by faith. The Christian life is continued in faith. The Christian life is finished in faith. So that's Paul's charge to Timothy, and that is what Paul is claiming he has done. That, and that, that's my desire. That, that when, if the Lord tarries and I die, that I'll be able to say, or those who knew me could say, that I finished the fight. You know, I fought the fight. I finished the race. I'm, I'm fighting now, and I'm racing now, but I have, I have hopefully many miles ahead of me. And yet Dave was faithful to the end, to the very last step, to the very last drop. Well, there's some good news here. Why, why would someone persevere like that? What m- motivation is there? And the good news is even though the Christian life is begun, begun by faith, continued by faith, finished by faith, the Lord himself is faithful. The Lord himself is faithful. If you're going to bank your eternity, if you're going to bank your life, and, and you've heard, Dave, Dave was faithful for half a century and more just in this body. You're pouring a lot of your life out for this. But God is faithful. And the first link we got at that was as Paul was calling Timothy to, to hold fast to his confession, he pointed them to Christ who is faithful in his life. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all. And of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. And so the first point of God being faithful is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was perfectly faithful. There's nothing that God is calling you and me to that Jesus Christ has not done already for us as an example. But more to the fact, if you pour yourself out for Christ, his church, his gospel, you are not pouring your life out for something in vain. Paul speaks with great confidence as he approaches death, not with any regret, not even with sorrow. Henceforth, he says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, or I think better translated, the crown which is righteousness. For Paul, the thing he most wanted was righteousness. I want to stop being this sinful person, and I want to be with the one who is righteous, and I want to be righteous that's his crown. He's, he's looking for it. It's laid up for him, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. See, God is faithful. You, you can trust him, and you can entrust yourself to him. And I know that would be Dave's desire. The profession of faith is wonderful, but we see from Paul the, the necessity of taking hold of life and persevering in that profession of faith, of fighting the fight, of finishing the race, keeping the faith. You want to come to your end being able to say what Paul said. Not I started the fight, I quit the race, I lost the faith, but I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. And, and Paul broadens this out not just for himself, but for any who would trust in Christ, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all 
who have loved his appearing. That includes Dave, and that can include you and me as well. Dave has finished his race. Dave has received his reward. Dave is with the Lord in glory, righteous, sinless, beholding God. We, we are the ones here behind mourning. That is right. But I know Dave's greatest desire would be that you, too, would receive that crown of righteousness, that you, too, would enter into the faith and continue in the faith, that you, too, would fight the good fight, that you, too, would finish the race, that you, too, would keep the faith, and by God's grace, um, th- that is what I will do or strive to do. That's what God is calling on you and myself to do as well. What an what a encouragement to know that God is faithful, that the reward is sure, that he will keep faithfully what we have entrusted to him. Now we're going to hear a, a song. I just encourage you to think through these things while Jim sings, Give Me Jesus. Um, we want to thank you again for coming, for sharing in this moment, this time. God has been so good to give us Dave for so long. And he does us no wrong in taking him home. So let's close in a word of prayer. Lord God, we miss our friend. We feel the loss. We are the poor. And yet you are good, and you do good. And we know that for, for David, this has worked out for his joy his glory. And so, Lord, we pray that you would um, help us to continue the fight of faith. Help us to continue our race. Help us to hold firm to the faith as well. We look forward to being reunited with Dave and others, but we look forward most of all to your appearing. We look forward to being freed from the power of sin in our life, receiving that crown of righteousness. Lord God, as we eat food, pray that you would bless it to our bodies, that you would help our conversation, our fellowship to be edifying. And Lord God, we just pray that you would um, strengthen and sustain Vi and the family in this time. In Jesus' name, amen.